Okay, this video is about bites and stings. And again, have a large chapter over a lot of different information. I try to just highlight the most important information or probably the most common types of bites. I didn't really get into stings too much um, because I wanted to hit some of the most common um, bites that you might experience so that you would know how to care for them. So I'm gonna have to move pretty quick so I don't run out of time. We have dogs that account for about 80% of the bites. So 80% of animal bites occur from dogs. Um, and normally 80% of those bites are trivial. So they don't do too much damage, can be treated at home. Um, maybe don't even break the skin, you know, don't do too much damage. So on animal bites, Normally what we see are tissue damage. So with animal bites we see some tissue damage and that should make sense, especially for dogs and cats. Um, really what we're worried about, not only with tissue damage, um, you see a lot more tissue damage with dogs um, than you do with cats, but we're also worried about infection. And even though rabies is, um, we only have about one or two deaths per year in the U.S. for rabies, it's still important um, if you don't know the animal and don't know if it's had its rabies shots to seek out medical attention so that you can be treated. Because normally an unprovoked attack um, may indicate the in animal has rabies. We also want to worry about tetanus, even though people get their tetanus shots. Uh, if you get bit, you definitely want to go have your another tetanus shot if it's been a while. If it's been more than 10 years since you've had it, um, definitely want to go have your tetanus shot. With cats, they tend to be um, more prone to infection from bites from cats, mainly because um, of the shape of the tooth. It tends to penetrate the skin. Um, more infection than dogs, I should say. And... Most of the time when animals bite, uh, when animals bite humans, tend to see most of the damage in the hands, legs, feet, and for, for children a lot of times in the face. And that can be scary, especially if you have young children around. Um, rabies, going back to some of the um, viruses and bacteria, and this being a virus, rabies, um, is bad in developing countries. So developing countries that don't have vaccinations, um, there's a rabies is still pretty pronounced and kills quite a few people each year. In the U.S. we don't have that problem because people normally seek medical attention and most of our animals have had rabies shots and stuff. And it's a virus that is going to be transmitted through saliva or some sort of bodily fluid from the animal. So it's a virus that's found in warm, warm blooded animals. That's an L there. I know it's hard to see. So cold blooded animals don't um, carry the virus. So you have a high risk group of animals that carry this that you want to avoid. High risk would be skunks, bats, fox, raccoons. But you still need to worry about, even from animals, even from dogs, dogs and cats, especially if they're wild, you still want to worry about, if it's an unprovoked attack, um, you still want to worry about rabies or any type of bite. If you don't know the animal, you still need to worry about it. So um, let's scroll up here real quick. Have different types of bites. Um, let, let's talk about human bites for a sec. So we have human bites. And there's different types of human human bites, and these are probably the most common after um, animals, or such as dogs and cats. Human bites are probably the next most common. So we have a wide range of bacteria, and I can speak of this firsthand because I experienced this a lot in law enforcement and people trying to bite you. 
and uh, wide range of bacteria in our mouths and viruses that can be carried. Um, it's a pretty scary deal when somebody tries to bite you. You've got two types. You've got true bites, which are intentional bites, where somebody intentionally tried to bite you, and they got their flesh between um, their teeth, your flesh between their teeth. Uh, you've got this normally happens in fights or cases like abuse. I used to see this a lot in domestic dis um, abuse cases, and um, you have what's called a clinch fist injury and I've actually experienced this I had this happen to me one time I've had two main well I've had more than just two but two that really scared me um, I had to fight against somebody I was trying to arrest one time and I ended up cutting my knuckle on their teeth they were fighting me trying to get a hold of my gun and I was doing everything I could to get them off of me and I ended up punching them in the mouth <laughs> and got an infection in my hand so this can be problematic here um, not only do I have to go through um, a medical to get control of the infection that I was experiencing but I had to make sure I didn't get any kind of disease from that and also had, had arrested an individual one time and she decided she was going to bite me and she did and she wasn't the type of person you'd want to bite you um, because of her profession and so I had to go through all sorts of testing on that too which was scary so um, the mouth can be a dirty thing so bacteria and vi viruses can be transmitted through there the clinch fist normally happens in fights as well or sometimes accident accidental like in sports this happens a lot people come in contact um, especially th places like well, football doesn't happen too much. So you see it sometimes in soccer. I know that's surprising. Um, but where people aren't wearing mouth guards, it, it's common. So um, it's unintentional uh, mo in most cases, unless somebody's punching you in the, in the mouth or punching another person in the mouth. So let's go over care. And this is going to be generic care here. I've kind of boiled this down. Your book separates it out from dogs, cats, and humans, and all that good stuff on the care. I'm going to just go over the most common you want to wash the area and don't scrub it because you might do more tissue damage and you're more likely to get tissue damage with um, animal bites especially dog bites so be real careful when you're washing it flush it with water so you're using the pressure of a faucet to kind of wash that out you want to control bleeding as much as possible uh, when you're washing it uh, if, if it's excessive bleeding you gotta get control of the bleeding first and then uh, after you get control of bleeding, it, it may be a while. It, you would treat it like a, a severe bleeding. If, if there was a lot of blood, you'd have to get control of it before you could wash it out. So I just wanted to make that obvious. But this is in case that you can get control of the bleeding. So control bleeding. So you want to put some sort of a sanitary, sanitized cover over it. So some sort of um, bandage. And then seek medical help. Seek medical help. And like I said earlier, I don't have a lot of time. I do want to talk a little bit about snake bites, especially with us being down here in South Texas. I was teaching a kickboxing class one time, and I decided it was the last day of class before finals, and we decided we were going to go out through a walk on a park, and a rattlesnake missed me by about 12 inches. So I was walking along with some students, and one of my students looked down and screamed, and I jumped. And luckily, I, she was actually closer to the snake than I was. But since it's a pit viper, I think it sensed my movement, saw the heat, sensed my movement. And even though she was closer, she had stopped, and I was still moving. So I think that's why it struck out at me. And then it decided to rattle. So that was kind of crazy. You, know, you would think a rattlesnake would rattle beforehand. Anyway, so uh, care for snake bites. You've got pit vipers. Let's just talk about pit vipers r real quick. You're, they're going to have a triangular head. So you've got the venom sacs over here on the side that kind of what gives them the um, the triangular head is that, that venom sac. So this is the top down view here. Um, pits can be anywhere. A lot of times you'll see their nostrils, but you'll see larger pits or even sometimes their pits are close. It depends on the snake. So what that's doing is it senses heat so that it can see the heat of an animal or heat of 
um, a possible predator and strike out at it if it needs to. So the first thing you want to do is get the victim away from the snake because snakes will continue to strike. Strike out about two thirds of their own length. So you want to be careful. You don't want to stay too close, especially with a rattlesnake or a copperhead or something like that, because um, they can be pretty aggressive. Don't capture or kill it. So I should say, don't. I should write that in there. Don't capture or kill. A lot of times people have been envenomated trying to capture or kill the snake, and the snake can continue to bite even if you chopped its head off. For quite some time. It's got those involuntary muscle movements. Um, you want to try to calm the victim. We're trying to lower their heart rate so that it doesn't pump the venom around as fast. And then you want to wash the area. So wash it. And while you're washing it, take off the jewelry. Oops, spelled that wrong. Let me back up here real quick. Jewelry. And the reason you would do that, especially if it's to the hand, um, or a limb or something that they may begin to swell so you want to take that jewelry off and you want to stabilize the limb if it's to a limb if it's to the core there's not much you can do there so you want to stabilize the limb so they don't continue to move around the main reason you're stabilizing that limb <coughs> is to pre slow circulation you're not trying to cut it off you're, you're just trying to slow circulation because if they move it around that's going to increase cir circulation and you have what's called a muscle pump in your in your body. So when muscles move around, they help pump blood. Muscle pumps, you're trying to um, slow that down. You don't want the muscle pumps to stay activated and assist blood flow back to the heart. And definitely med medical care. And for pit vipers, you're going to have anti-venom. And the only pit viper we have here in the U.S. is the Mojave rattlesnake. It not only has a hemotoxin, um, but it also has a neurotoxin, one of the most deadly um, combinations. Because the hemotoxin is going to destroy tissue, and the neurotoxin is going to affect the central nervous system and eventually shut down breathing. Um, let's talk real quick about coral snake. Most of the care is the same. Um, you're going to wrap up. And you, you can do the same even for a pit viper. You're going to wrap the injured area around the injury or the bite site. That's to help, and not too tight, just what you would do if you, were, if you had a sprained ankle. So wrap up the injury site. And then, because um, you want mild pressure. So you do all the other steps above. So you would calm the victim, clean with soap and water, Apply mild pressure. Um, do not cut. Do not cut and suction. I know they sell the suction kits, but don't do that. Do not cut and suction the wound. And then seek medical attention. Here's the problem, though. There's no antivenom. Well, I shouldn't say there's none. They no longer make antivenom in the US for coral snakes. They quit production of it. It was, wasn't worth their effort. There was very few coral snake bites. So I don't know if they're shipping it in now, if hospitals will even have it, but I'm sure it's in limited supply. So if you got to see a coral snake, just leave it alone. It's not worth the, the risk of injury. And anyway, this was a long chapter. I'm running out of time. So there's a lot more to it, a lot of bites and stings I didn't list. Um, go through that chapter and read it. Go through the PowerPoint and read it. But I just want to hit the major points. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one.